So my original plan actually for this lecture was that in the second part I wanted to talk more about randomized measurement so that it's more general context in the particular, you know, with uh, John Preskill and friends who wrote this uh, review article, we called it the randomized uh, measurement toolbox. It came out in Nature Reviews uh, just, uh, I don't know, uh, half a year ago or something like that, a little bit more. Uh, which summarizes many of these things coming sort of, you know, from the side how we develop these things. And then, of course, there's these classical shadows that are really a brilliant idea. In the particular, these classical shadows come with, you know, quantitative estimates that we, in our analysis, originally did not have to estimate, you know, how many measurements does it take in order to. Uh, this is condensed, so we were somehow complementary what we did, and we put it together in one review. So for us, the key papers that I talked about now before, at least once over here, and the class the shadow one, I mean, the really famous one is the one over here, and these are people on the right that did these things. And as I said, you know, we sort of have experimental data from over here. And uh, the great thing about this class the shadow is to talk then about, you know, how many measurements does it take in order to, and then the whole story starts, and then uh, this is really what the concept is. Uh, but, um, let me sort of do now something a little bit different that uh, maybe goes more coherently with the story that I've told you before. I would like to probably now take these randomized measurement uh, ideas, but at the end, what we want is to sort of talk maybe more about the physics per se and what we're doing here with quantum simulation. And uh, I would like to speak about uh, entanglement Hamiltonian tomography. Okay? This is something very interesting. Sorry, before we proceed, can I just be, can I ask a question about the previous section again? Is there something that came up during break? Uh, sure, yeah. Can you return to the plot that shows uh, entangled, or calculated security versus accepted slash zero detection? Yeah. And to clarify, what were the different theories describing? So five theories or something, do you recall? Okay, so you're simply asking, I'm showing here data points, and I'm showing also uh, that come from experiment, but there's an underlying theory, and what kind of assumption did you make to the theory, right? No, 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 I'm just asking right now, really simply, what, what are the theories of the difference? Is it time evolution? Like okay, ah, sorry, yes. Uh, so this is different time. This is time equal to zero up here, these black dots. Maybe let me go back here. No. These black dots, still, this is time equal to zero. The time equal to zero, we prepare a product state, an L state, spin up, spin down, spin up, spin down. It's a pure state, so we better get, you know, for all of these things here, one, okay, because uh, Brady entropy in pure state is supposed to be one. It's not one over here for the total system because there's measurement errors. And now we turn on the time evolution. And what you can see now is the time evolution. It starts now at different times. And uh, this simply shows that, you know, when I have my total system, it's supposed to be still in a pure state. And indeed, you can see over here that the right-hand side over here, well, we got 0.76 at the very beginning, which I said was a measurement error. But during the time evolution, this doesn't change. So if we had longer time evolution, though, we would expect more deeper turns, right? At towards subsystem size n. You would expect, there's a little bit of change over here, but it's sort of, you know, a very minor change that things are sort of getting worse, you know, but uh, I would it, say, you know, so. Is that, like, measurement error the measurement error was the dominant part in this particular experiment. Okay, so this had some uh, historical reasons, whatever, and this is what you can see over here. So if we had perfect measurements, then we would expect actually more differences between the period data at point n, right? It would be one, and then... But if you have no measurement in preparation, whatever, no decoherence, then you would expect that the right-hand side should always be one. Okay, and then if we added in decoherence, then we would see... And if I add decoherence, then it goes a little bit uh, worse, okay? So you can see over here the decoherence is not really so bad. The main error over here was the experimental measurement error. So, so really, spam error is actually a key concern of computing theory. Yes, yeah, so okay. Don't forget, this is a more historical experiment over here. Okay. In the meantime, they are much better. And it turned out that they got actually some wrong random unitaries in there. Uh, this was in the early days, and uh, so there's a lot of things that in the meantime are done much much better than what you can see over here. Okay. Wonderful, thank you. But I think that the main message of the point is really that if I take, if I bipartition the system, you can see that the purity over here is pretty small, and the purity becoming here small and getting smaller and smaller as a function of time evolution, this is the indicator or the quantifier over here of the entanglement buildup, you know, during this quench dynamics. 
But you are right, probably also you were saying though that there's also some decoherence part in there. Uh, but decoherence relative to the coherent part is on the level of a few percent. You know, so it's a dominant part, and this is sort of still early in the game. We would expect that if you go very long times, it would be thermal and so on, but we cannot go into this with things. Okay, thank you. Good question. Yeah. Okay, so my plan was to talk about uh, these things over here, particular, I don't talk about that. But uh, let me sort of uh, move on and uh, sort of continue the story. We really would like to do an entanglement Hamiltonian tomography, and we would like to do it in a regime that is not accessible to standard tomography, uh, because we would like to go to very large system sizes, hopefully in a way that at the end might even work in some regime of quantum advantage that we have in our simulator. Uh, of course, it's been taking a long time, and there's a lot of things to discuss, but we want large particle numbers that tomography paints. How do we do that? And uh, so let me start out by briefly summarizing now, you know, what we have with this randomized measurement, how we see that, and then we move on and talk kind of about an excellent experiment uh, that was done recently. So uh, the sort of uh, general concept of randomized measurement is that we have here, I draw it like, well, there may be a quench dynamics, there could be a heat free circuit, or whatever you did, dynamics over here, then you have your wave function. You apply here uh, unitaries, which could either be global unitaries, they could be local unitaries, as I described now just in the previous slides over here. You got your bit swings, and the story that always sort of goes like this. You got your quantum mechanical probabilities for a given unitary. You have your bit swings that are called here S and S prime. And then you have here a classical cross correlation of these different probabilities over here. Notice, you know, that this could be an experiment one on day one in lab one. This could be an experiment on day two in lab two over here. You know, so these kind of these are the quantities that we're interested in, and the Rainy entropy was a particularly simple example of all of that. And then using the fact that we got the circular unitary ensemble, these things like two designs are coming in, and so on. This is sort of these cost correlations. Uh, one part is quantum mechanical, but uh, this uh, average that we have over here is really a classical average. And uh, for this classical, at the end, we pay the price. If you replace this by some quantum correlations between the two copies of the system, so it will always be of course, at the end, more, uh, more efficient. So this is sort of a hybrid classical quantum protocol. Um, the reason why it's good is that we can do it today in the lab. Okay, so we wrote a bunch of papers, you know, that are listed over here. And I decided now to pick up one of these papers over here, which was on this entanglement of Antonian tomography that developed in two stages. There was a theory paper. At that point, we did have an experimental data. data and then we went uh, con to con convince the experimentalists to try it. Some of these things, and this is what I would like to show you now in the following, and this is this uh, you know, measurement of the entanglement Hamiltonian. So let me give you the story behind it. And maybe I should go back first by telling you, well, uh, the slide that I had here before was about the Rainy entropy, you know, and, uh, and then there was a corresponding formula over here where these are these probabilities given the U, U was the random unitary, this is a random variable, and then the, this is sort of an estimating over here uh, our, our purity over here. This was our formula. And it's actually very simple, you know, to write down now uh, a formula where you would simply say, oh, can we actually estimate the whole density matrix? So at that point, we're sort of doing a randomized tomography. Uh, we are doing here uh, you no know, basis measurements in a random basis. And there will be a very similar formula over here. You can see this is an operator now over here that we estimate by having a certain number of unitaries over here. These S and S prime over here are just measurements that we're taking over here. There's this part, this is the, you know, S is the vector that would correspond to the projection that we get over here after our measurement here. U is the unitary, this is becoming very much related to the shadow kind of things that uh, John Presque and I wrote down. And there's an identity that sort of looks like that over here, okay? Um, and if I take the average, I get this thing out. But of course, uh, at that point, I'm caught, you know, again, what I said before, tomography is exponentially expensive, okay? Uh, but I also made the remark before, if you know something about the quantum state, and we know we are doing quantum simulation, and the wave function that we get from quantum simulation, they are derived from a Hamiltonian that can be quasi-local. The Hamiltonians are very simple. I know this is putting in this knowledge. If you try to put in this knowledge and combine it, you know, with these uh, sort of expressions that we have over here, we might be able to get something which is then an efficient, and I've explained the word efficient, entanglement Hamiltonian tomography, that we are learning 
sort of learning in the sense of machine learning, and you know, the operator structure of the entanglement Hamiltonian, and this is the kind of game that we play now in the following. And so the goal is now to learn the operator structure by saying that we know something about this thing over here. It has a certain form, you know, that uh, maybe only very simple operator structure, and then combining these things from here, the measurement data that go in here, and comparing it with here, we might be able to learn this entanglement Hamiltonian. That's what we are going to do now here in the following. Okay, so you can see there is, there is no free lunch here. Okay, no free lunch. Okay, but uh, that's what it is. Okay, so in that sense, I've taken out a paper that we put in the archive now uh, a little bit of time ago, and uh, these are the various people involved here, Christian Cochran, and Rick Babine, and the theorists, and uh, Manoj Chosi, uh, was the experimentalist, key experimentalist, and this was done. In this 51, I simulated the lab of uh, Rainer Blatt and Christian Rose, as I mentioned. Okay, that's the lab again. Then we see that we talk about real experiments over here. Now comes the story. So I give you first an outline of how you really design an experiment and how you then decide what you would like to see and uh, raise certain expectations, you know, what you can see. And then uh, based on that, we will present an analysis of this entanglement Hamiltonian topology. So we are sort of halfway through actually in preparing the whole story over here. In the following sense. So I told you before when we talked about variational quantum Einstein solver, uh, we mentioned before that well, you know, uh, one day you wake up in the morning, you say today it's the Heisenberg model, okay, and uh, we write down our circuits, we test them, and we prepare the ground states. We get two percent of the ground state. We never get the real ground state, but we don't really mind. Two percent is pretty good already. And this is the stage over here. Now where we have 51 ions, we have the subsystem over here. And we would like to learn then at the end this entanglement Hamiltonian that uh, we talked about over here. So we would like to do a complete quantum state tomography of a subsystem. And the subsystem sizes at the end are supposed to be something like 20 or even larger. So they're really large. So forget about tomography. Okay, yeah, so large subsystem sizes. And we want to do it by not uh, measuring uh, rho A, but uh, measuring uh, uh, this uh, H tilde, which was the entanglement Hamiltonian. Here is the Hamiltonian that we wrote down at the beginning, and uh, let me visualize now what we are going to do. So we have here entanglement properties we are after. Here is sort of uh, a pictorial illustration, don't take this too literally, of the energy spectrum of the Hamiltonian up there. There would be the ground state down here, and there's an, uh, what we call it the unheated state. So ideally I would like to prepare a single ground state. Ideally I would like to prepare a single excited state. We cannot do that, but we can prepare superpositions very close to the ground state. And you can see that by the by this bracket over here, and we prepare states that are um, maybe I don't know 15 percent of the total energy spectrum, 50 percent. So you might look at it like a microcanonical ensemble, sort of like, but it's not really because it's a coherent superposition of these states over here. And then you would like to study now the entanglement properties of these states uh, by fully characterizing, you know, this uh, uh, it, by this entanglement Hamiltonian or the whole density. So what kind of things will we be after? Well, the first thing that you might sort of know is this, that if I have a local Hamiltonian, and I go to the ground state, uh, matrix product states, and all of these things make their living from the fact that for these particular Hamiltonians that we have, the ground state, you know, you have the simple quasi-local interactions and all of that, you have area law entanglement. So very little entanglement, you know. If you have little entanglement, you can do classical computations based on that. If you go up to the uh, to highly excited states over here, this would be where the subsystem would be a thermal state, you know, that you pick out over here, this region A. Uh, then, of course, you expect volume law entanglement. This is what you learned in your course on statistical mechanics or thermodynamic, uh, thermodynamics. You know, um, the entropy scales, you know, like the volume of the whole thing, and not like the area, you know, the surrounding volume. So these are things that can be seen at in an experiment. Uh, and, uh, you know, we would like to do that, actually, in this Heisenberg model. Uh, I'm plotting here sort of a, uh, a quantum phase diagram. You can see that if delta is equal to 1, so this delta is this thing back here, so all three terms, xx, y, y, c, c, that be the same magnitude. Uh, this is a critical point here, delta equal to 1. Actually, this region, the conformal peak theory is valid. Uh, we see why I'm saying that, uh, because of following the repeat or conformal field theory to give us a good guess for what the structure of this entanglement Hamiltonian is. Over here we have an antiferromagnetic phase and we will look at two points, one, the 1.7 that we have over here, 
and we will ask these questions about you know area law, volume law, but then really the complete tomography uh, of the whole state uh, at these two points. Okay, this will be our setup. Okay, and uh, this part we already did. You know, we sort of have here state preparation and analysis. We can prepare the ground state. I already showed you. You know, we can also prepare heated states. I will tell you afterwards how we got these states up here. Actually, in a very primitive way, but just applying the cooling circuit here once again. But before you scramble up, um, no attempt here to produce a single excited state or whatever. We just want something which is a little bent up here, like a microcanonical ensemble. And then we could, would like to run our protocol over here. You're taking data for the subsystem over here. And what we would like to do at the end is to get the entanglement Hamiltonian out from these data. So this is data, we have classical post process entanglement Hamiltonian. And of course, then uh, we would like to use these things to find out, for example, volume law, area law entanglement. But really, then the whole you know, uh, density matrix over here parameterized by the entanglement Hamiltonian for large system sizes. This is sort of the experimental scenario that we have in mind. So the left-hand side we already talked about, you know, except for this protocol over here, down here, and the right-hand side is sort of more asking the physics question that we want to see. And uh, I really emphasize that what we do now here in the following, uh, this is, uh, you know, you could take other platforms, you know, you can 2D systems and so on, other Hamiltonians, so what I tell you is rather generic, so don't take it Oh, this applies to ions only in 1D and so on. This is rather generic statement. So that is what we're looking for. Uh, nothing in life is ever completely generic, but you will see the following you know, things are happening there. Okay? So we already have cooled it down. We got this thing. I talked about that before. We can move on. So let me now say a few things about learning the entanglement Hamiltonian and how we do that. And I had before you know, this statement that, well, we got some measurement data, for example, from randomized measurements over here. And we would like to find this entanglement Hamiltonian over here. And we concluded before it was expensive, except for small system sizes. Uh, we don't have small system sizes here. Uh, but or we know something about the quantum state. And I mentioned before, we know something about the quantum state because we said we do quantum simulation. And our Hamiltonians have a very specific structure that generated for us the particular entangled state that we wanted, not the ground state, so that the heated state. So this state remembers, you know, the Hamiltonian that was generated by that data. Okay, so do we know something about this structure uh, to make this tomography efficient? Okay, and uh, uh, one notice over here, you know, there have been papers, actually this is parallel to this nature physics paper I mentioned from our group by uh, Anshu here. They have something called sample efficient learning of interacting quantum systems, and they simply say we've got a deep state over here. This is a deep state, and you see this is a by definition, a deep state over here. Uh, if this Hamiltonian this is a simple physical Hamiltonian that has only one body, two body interactions, but not a 10 body interactions or whatever, this Hamiltonian learning can be done efficiently. So there's mathematical proofs you know, that if it is a deep state of a Hamiltonian, which is has a finite operator support, you know, then we have efficient algorithms for doing that. Okay? And this is sort of what we're now relying on the following, and this is the basis of what we do. So what do we know? Okay, so at that point, I appeal to a theorem that I'm pretty sure none of you have ever heard before. This is from a very mathematical uh, corner of the physics silver space, uh, uh, from quantum field theory. It's called the Bissignano Wichmann theorem, and I will give you a very simple explanation. You know, theorems always come, you know, if I assume this, this, and this, then the outcome is that. Okay, and what this theorem tells you, but it is a very general and very generic theory and remarkable you know, in its own way. I mean, every time I look at it, I see that's, it's amazing that this is true. It says the following. So the theorem was derived by people working on relativistic quantum field theory, which means that we have Lorentz invariants. So notice that there are certain symmetries that are behind the whole story. You know, you make assumptions about symmetries. This is key to the story, you know. It was asked us at the end, is this really true or not? And uh, when you write down the Hamiltonian, you know, I just write this for 1D, but actually the theory is valid in all dimensions. If you write down the quantum field theory, this is your uh, Hamiltonian density that you have over here. It can be a very complicated interacting system. It could be integrable, non-integrable, whatever you want, but it should be a relativistic quantum field theory with a Lorentz invariance that we have over here. Okay? And let's look at something that uh, most of us will find out very interesting. The case over here, namely the vacuum state, that ask about entanglement of the vacuum state. At the end, we're going to rephrase this thing as a property of a many-body system. 
Uh, this thing will be the ground state of interacting many body systems. You know, when we rewrite it. But for the moment, this is we ask about the entanglement structure of the vacuum state of the relativistic quantum field theory. Illustrated in a simple way, you know, uh, if I take a 1D system for the moment, it is valid in high dimensions, and I apply partition into A and B. Uh, the statement here is a remarkably simple one, namely that the trace of uh, over the system B over here, if you want to reduce density to a greater than this part over here, of the vacuum state, the ground state of my system, is simply an exponential, and it has the form of a Gibbs ensemble. You know, if this beta over here, this inverse temperature was a constant, you can pull it out of the integral, and this thing would be the, uh, uh, would over here simply be the, the Hamiltonian, you know, the one that we wrote down over here. And you can see this would be the Gibbs ensemble for a given temperature beta. But the statement of this theory in is that the reduced density matrix has the form of a Gibbs ensemble, however, with a local inverse temperature. Okay? So beta becomes dependent on x. How does the beta over here go? Well, uh, the inverse temperature over here that you have is very hot, which means that beta is small at the cut over here. Uh, this means that you know if the temperature uh, is very hot, then it means that this state, think about it locally, very, very mixed. But it's kind of clear, you know, you've got the entanglement over here, and if you cut it in the middle, you know, there will be entanglement, so it will be very mixed and very hot over here. And this theorem sort of implies it, because if I'm moving away from this cut, you know, there's a linear ramp, this beta, and so this temperature, this inverse temperature has a very, very specific dependence, but otherwise it is a very generic statement. So we have very re remarkably here an expression for the ground state of a relativistic quantum field theory, that the reduced density operator has the form of the Gibbs ensemble, however, with a local inverse temperature, which is very hot at the cut, and then cools off and it wants to walk away from that. Okay? This is theory. Okay, not much to argue. So, in other words, you know, we can identify this object that we have up here as the entanglement Hamiltonian, because, you know, we get now a prescription over here that simply says, if I take my original Hamiltonian and I, uh, you know, deform my Hamiltonian density over here with this ramp, this is the Prisciliano Wichmann ramp that you have over here. Uh, so it's simply telling uh, my having the Hamiltonian and multiplying it by ramp. So what this theory tells us is that the entanglement Hamiltonian is nothing than the original Hamiltonian, but locally multiplied by a ramp. Can't be simpler. It's amazing that this is true. Any interacting system. But of course, don't forget, it comes to the symmetry. And the symmetry is, of course, a key to all of that. There are some references here, in particular, if you want to read about this, there's this review by Marcello, who wrote about these things. Uh, 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 if you add now, go to conformal field theory, that I mentioned before the relation with the isotope model, you have, of course, adding scale invariance to the system, and this allows us, this is this uh, uh, paper by, by Cassini, I don't know. I take a, a part of the system out of here, you get the same result, but now this uh, inverse temperature has the form of a parabola. So, you know, it's uh, beta is zero at the two edges, very hot there, and very entangled, and if you move away, it gets less and less, and then it gets to the other side, it is again very entangled. You know, this is what the statement is. Very pictorial and so on, and now you might say, well, uh, it's not true over here to take a, a, you know, a lattice system, this doesn't apply to the system, but why don't we apply it nonetheless? You know, in sort of an approximate way, and uh, you know, you would simply say that if I got now an interacting many body Hamiltonian, that I may have maybe the effective peak theory is sort of, you know, for uh, emerging for very low energies, something which is a relativistic quantum field theory, then these things should somehow approximate it too. So this means that if I write down this entanglement Hamiltonian, it simply means that we got kind of a recipe Take the original Hamiltonian, multiply it by beta L, and beta L, for example, over here in this conformal case, would be have the form of a parabola. You know? So we have a very simple prescription that uh, conformal field theory suggests that the entanglement Hamiltonian is simply the original system Hamiltonian multiplied by a parabola. Okay? That's a hands-on idea that we can test first of all theoretically with simple calculations, in particular 1D. But we can also try to see them 
this provides a reasonable ansatz that we can try in an experiment. And of course, it is very important to realize that when we do that, you know, that we have here maybe additional terms that we have to test if they are there or not, you know. So this is not an exact theory in the particular case of these lattices. So to zero order this may be true, a parabola, but we really want to see that plus maybe corrections over there. It turns out that we never see these corrections because they're too small. You can test this first of all, you know, um, uh, with analytical models. There's many analytical models, like if I take the standard IC model with nearest neighbor coupling, it turns out this is an exact analytical result that comes out. Quite amazing, you know. Then you can also do numerics, you do the ground state of the system, you know, like Heisenberg. I talked about Heisenberg before. You see the beautiful parabola, you know. So this seems to be that the structure of the entanglement Hamiltonian uh, is very often rather simple, you know, and the density matrix would be very complicated. Um, and uh, so the second point of the story is that this sort of now is maybe the missing element in our whole discussion because it provides us with an ansatz that we can try, but we should also verify at the end, you know, if indeed the ground states or approximate ground states that we generate have the structure of the form which is suggested by this very fundamental theory from quantitative theory. And this now starts the story, of course, that we have here a many body system. Again, you can see my spectrum over here, and then we sort of guide you now through the expectation, and I can show you the result. So I showed you before, this is the model that we want. We have here a critical uh, region, you know, where conformal field theory is valid, the critical at this point over here. We will pick this point afterwards, but we will expect that this state should be valid, and then we will walk away into the gap or any region over here that these theorems are not uh, valid, but we will nonetheless try it. And as a matter of fact, in some cases, there are some analytical results that also indicate the validity there, but in a different form. So, and, uh, but I would like you to think about the whole problem now in the following sense. So, we are doing an experiment, and we prepare first the ground state. That is not a real ground state, but an approximate ground state, and we are excited state, but not one. It would be very hard for these large systems. But something which is maybe more like a microcanonical ensemble of some superposition up there. Okay, um, for the ground state, as I said before, we have here uh, area lock. If you have the conformal field theory, there would be a lock correct over here with a central charge that goes in front. In the case of the Heisenberg model that we discussed, the central charge is one, so it turns out that this is a pretty small correction in the experiment that we are trying to figure that out. So you find that the error in measuring the central charge is about 10%, so it doesn't really work so well uh, over here because it's a small correction. Up there, we have our volume law entanglement that I mentioned before, like we expect for thermal entropies. Uh, so you can see that these volume law states they occupy the largest part of Hilbert space over here. There's this area law space uh, they live in the little corner. And of course, it also comes with a comment that this is why classical tensor network simulations work. Okay. And up there, volume law entanglement. Entanglement, it can be too large to be represented classically. And, uh, but quantum simulators can, of course, do that uh, easily. You know? OK, so um, let me now discuss this a little bit from the point of view of the eigenstate thermalization hypothesis. And don't take this too literally. This is sort of more to generate a little bit of feeling, you know, a physical feeling of what's going on. Uh, what does this thing say? So if I got prepared a single eigenstate up here, which we do approximately, and I take my system and I turn to take a certain subregion out, uh, like I did before in my discussion of conformal field theory, uh, then eigenstate thermalization hypothesis tells me that the expectation value of some observable that lives in the uh, region down here is basically the same as having a thermal ensemble in you know, over the Hamiltonian over here restricted to the corresponding subspace uh, that we have here. And so this means that we would kind of expect that the reduced density operator, you know, uh, that uh, in the thermal region over here would be my system Hamiltonian, but now restricted to A, and of course it will be boundary terms and the rest, but we are going to do these things called very large subsystem sizes, so the boundary terms we expect them to be sort of under control, and you will see them afterwards actually uh, coming up, uh, what we have there, boundary terms, and you can see that I can of course always rewrite this thing as an e to the sum. Can you see I'm writing this thing as a theta i h i, this is exactly a deformed Hamiltonian, so if you have one temperature, this is a thermal state, this beta i that I'm writing over here, they are constant. You know, for the ground state, they will be parabolas. Okay, this is my parameterization that I would like to 
show you now on the right hand side over here. So this is my local temperature profile. So you can see that on the right hand side, uh, if this thing is a thermal state, I would expect that my reduced density operator has this structure over here, that is uh, theta i, these inverse temperatures, they are flat. You know, we have a flat temperature profile. There's one temperature in the whole system. This is flat over here. This is an indicator of these thermal states that you have up there. And I can do that for different subsystem sizes. And if you do that, I mean, this is exactly, of course, then um, like, a, like a thermal state. Thermal states have volume law entropy. In the 1D system is with linear MA. So we would expect to see a scaling of the von Neumann entanglement entropy as a function of my subsystem size that goes linear in the LA, volume law entanglement. This is our expectation, okay? Provided we are able to measure this thing, okay? Uh, what happens now if you cool? Well, I already gave you the answer, though, before we talked about relativistic quantum field theory and ground states. And uh, now we have here a many body system and we look at the interactive ground states of our system here. Eisenberg model, which by the way is integrable, so that's a bit interesting thing what integrability actually brings. Again, you might say over here, well, let's make an ansatz and let's represent these things here uh, with the local temperature. Uh, we expect from Bissimiano Wichmann or from conformal field theory, there should be a parabola over here. Again, this would sort of go like that. And we would then sort of expect as the outcome that we would like to see in the experiment that we have here maybe a logarithmic correction uh, here at the critical point. So, correction like this, that's sort of here. You can see again what I said, you know. Uh, uh, this is very mixed over here at the boundaries. It's cold in the middle. This is exactly the profile that you would expect <coughs> for the reduced density operator with the local temperature that you have over here. Okay, this is what you expect. So these are, and I mean, don't be misled that this only works for high end in 1D. And for the particular model, these are very, very general statements that have to do with quantum simulation. So we're not up uh, to be in the corner of whatever. No, these are rather universal statements. Okay. So um, what's interesting is that if you move away from the critical point, you would say, a priori, well, conformal field theory is no longer valid. There's some exactly solvable models around, like for three fermions. What they show is this, that uh, the same thing is still true, but the structure here changes. For example, this is sort of more peak type, more triangle type, you know, if you ask me why, but this is how it comes out. We'll see that afterwards. It's not so much of a uh, so now let's slow, slowly come to the point. So we have our Heisenberg model. We have our sort of phase diagram here, uh, central charge equals one conformal field theory, this region over here, with the anti ferromagnet And then uh, let's go to the point, uh, theta equal to one over here. Uh, this is now our ansatz that we make for this Hamiltonian. We can add additional terms. This is simply a deformation of the original Hamiltonian over here, where we just multiply local uh, uh, temperatures over here in front of this whole thing and put this into the ansatz, and this is sort of the ansatz that we have over here. Um, notice that what you're doing is that you're doing entanglement Hamiltonian learning, uh, like the one of the Gibbs state, but not the one that Hanshu had with the constant temperature, but it is something where you really are after the temperature profile. Okay, this is what you do over here. Well, first of all, you do yourself a little theory, you know, to convince yourself that it works. And Indeed, you know, for the excited state, this is pretty flat at the boundary. It's not that work so well, but as I said before, boundary effects are there. You know, this is what you expect. You can see beautiful parabolas, and then you convert these things. Knowing now the density matrix, you can see that this is the logarithm over here, and this is the volume law entanglement. This is theory, okay? And now um, you compare now these sort of ansatz that you get, you know, with the real D of our G calculation, with the densities that you get over here. Are actually amazingly high for the system sizes that we consider over here. At the end, we go much larger than the 9 city indicator over here. Let's go to the lab. Uh, we already cooled to the ground state. This is a circuit over here. We can do some data taking over here, and I will tell you now the details of how we do the entanglement Hamiltonian tomography just after that, after showing you now results. Uh, you know, what do we get now? So, this is preparing the ground state. What do you expect now at these two points? This is the critical point, and this is walking away from the critical point. And now what you're showing here is the von Neumann entropy that we are able to measure now based on things that I explain now in a few minutes. You can see this is pretty flat over here. You know, I would call this thing an area law. Yeah, I think it is. Yeah. Uh, we can at 
yet go to subsystem sizes more than 20. This is on the next slide over here. Um, what is the underlying you know, structure of these inverse temperatures that we can see over here? And can you see a very beautiful problem over here? Uh, where we take these fit parameters, these individual uh, inverse temperatures that we have. We can add additional terms here. You might be concerned about the fact that this is an integrated model. We have to add some chemical potentials. It turns out that we have zero. We just recently also saw a paper that argued that this could be the case. So these are results we get. And if we move away to the point of 1.7, where the whole theory should no longer apply, still seems to be true. Well, in some examples, we know uh, the same thing, uh, but it's sort of more peaked over here. This is what expected from some analytically solvable models that we have. What happens now if you do something very primitive? 